Blessed are the weird people. Poets. Misfits. Painters. Writers. Troubadours. For they teach us to see the world through different eyes. This is Blessed Are the Weird on Empower Radio. EmpowerRadio.com. Here's your host, Jacob Nordby. <clears throat> Hello, my friends. Hello, wherever you find yourself in the world today. I'm Jacob Nordby. This is Blessed Are the Weird radio show on the Empower Network. And um, I'm just thrilled to have you join us today for this very special Friday the 13th, extremely lucky episode into uh, Blessed Weirdness. And uh, as you might know, I work from home. And so mm, don't always take care of personal grooming first thing in the morning because no one's really here to see what I'm up to. But today, today, because of this show, I got up and and cleaned up and shaved and groomed. And so I have this very special guest joining us today, and I'm just excited to have her with us. So without a whole lot of introduction, I do have with us uh, Oriah Mountain Dreamer. She's a storyteller and a poet. Most of you listening probably have come in contact with her work, but those of you who haven't, she wrote the book, The Invitation. She wrote The Dance, The Call, and several other books, and she is working on some more right now, which uh, most of us just eagerly await. So, Araya, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome to the show. My pleasure, Jacob, and, and thank you for shaving. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm all clean. You know, it's kind of like I shaved my legs for this, so we better just really do a... <laughs> So happy to have you with us, Araya. And you know, it's funny, I've been in contact now with your work uh, for a while, and actually for years. And so I feel like this is a conversation I've been having with you for a long time, actually. And and the fact is, I've never spoken with you before today in, in uh, by voice. So I'm just thrilled to make your acquaintance. Oh, well, thank you. It's lovely. And, and a writer always loves to hear that people feel they're having a conversation when they're reading. Yeah. Well, your work in particular, um, you know, I, I shared with you before the show, I, I'm finally actually reading some of your books, which is, is I can't believe that didn't happen before, but your work in particular uh, makes me feel like we're sitting down after, um, you know, a long week perhaps, and just sort of comparing notes from the road. Um, I'm reading The Invitation right now and just about through with it, and it's just, it, is, it has that feeling for me. Actually, it's, I, I'm writing this down because suddenly I'm collecting titles right now um, for some of the new writing. Notes from the Road would make a great title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's it's funny you say that. I've used that phrase a lot because I've just come to see uh, myself and all of the people in my life, whether I know them in person or just have connected with them some other way, as fellow travelers. In fact, you know, Araya, I, I titled today's show Beautiful, Gentle, Ruthless, quest as i've read your book and there's something in that that show title which sort of suggests the idea of, of seeking for something for the big the big answer with a capital t and i'm curious while we get this started in just a moment i want to have you if you'd be so kind as to um read or recite i'm sure you probably know it by heart by now but uh, your your initial poem the invitation but i'd love to hear you tell us a bit about this quest, what it is to spend a lifetime of inquiring into the sacred mystery. You know, I, I'm, I'm infinitely curious, and I think that was always true, and about pretty much everything. I mean, you know, I'm one of these people who is always asking the, the questions that, you know, things like, why is it warmer when it snows than it was the day before? Is it warm because it's snowing, or does it snow because it's a little bit warmer? Um, and... <laughs> You know, questions that have no real impact on my life. Um, but, of course, I'm, I have more passion for those that do have an impact. And also, I have more access to information, although sometimes it doesn't seem so, um, about my inner world than I somehow, sometimes have about anything else. So, uh, you know, some of it is just this endless curiosity about why do I and other people do what we do? Why do we make the choices that we make? Um, why do we have this experience of something larger than ourselves? Is that just delusion? Is it, uh, you know, something we make up to comfort ourselves in the night? Um, which is not my experience, but, you know, it's a question sort of worth asking. And what do I know for sure? And, of course, the, the further I go down this path, a good piece of it is discovering the enormity of what I don't know. 
So then the question becomes, how, how do we live with that? How do we live with the enormity of what we can't know? It's a and fascinating... Still live, you know, still live close to the bone. And I guess what I would say is that the center of my quest is to live intimately with myself, with others, with the world. I mean, as close as I can get to what does this moment hold? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Araya, I spent my young life in a very perfectionistic, fundamentalist Christian um, environment. And there was this absolute truth feeling. And I remember the first time I started to, well, it wasn't the first time, but many times started to peek outside that. The, the edges got a little frayed, so I sort of saw outside of the the shell, which had been so safe and solid. And I remember feeling both invited and terrified by, as you call it, the enormity of all of it, of this mystery. And I remember then leaving that safety and going out looking for the next big safety and finding it. And then finding out that the edges on that also got frayed. And so life kept asking me to go forward. Have you discovered that as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I do think often at some point people come to a bit of a crisis with that as we catch on to the fact that there is no absolute safety. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that this is the nature of life is a kind of, I mean, I'm not suggesting we don't learn things. We do. But then we realize the limits of what we've learned and that there's a whole piece of life outside of what we've just learned. And honestly, I think at that point, we generally unconsciously either decide to start loving the questions, or we start pulling back and making our life smaller. Yes, yes, wow. And what happens when we pull back and make our life smaller? What is the experience of that? Because I know you've worked with people all over and have noticed people doing, taking either approach. Well, you know, a friend and I used to laugh and they call this uh, hunker medicine. We hunker on down, you know. <laughs> we try to hang on to what we've got. And, of course, the, the irony is, I mean, everything we know in this life, everything we cherish, everything we hold dear to us in terms of people and places and our memories. Both my parents have Alzheimer's, right? So I'm all too aware that the memories we hold dear um, can go also. And so there is this all-pervasive impermanence in this lifetime. And uh, that's a tough one to come to terms with. I mean, we say we do because we get it intellectually. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, watching it happen, feeling it happen, knowing that there are pieces that we don't even get to decide at times what the rate of that impermanence is or, you know, when something may be over. I have a, a friend whose husband died this year, perfectly healthy man, 57 years old, dropped dead of an aneurysm. Mm-hmm. So, and that kind of thing just, you know, reminds us we have no idea. Yeah. No idea. So, so what kind of, of source within us, around us, do we need to draw on to go out every day, to get up every day and let our hearts be open, uh, being conscious of the fact that we don't know. We don't know if this is our last day or what else is going to happen or, you know, um, just that enormity. And uh, that's, you know... It, not to do that, to hunker on down and say, well, I'm just going to, you know, stick to what I know. The problem is it doesn't work. Aside from the fact that you close off all kinds of potential areas of exploration and learning, it also doesn't work. It doesn't keep you safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the, that's the frightening reality, isn't it? Is the, 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 the more we hunker, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't yeah. drive the mystery away, does it? No, it's not like I'm not going to age another day if I just hunker down with everything I know now, you know. <laughs> You know, Araya, my, my oldest son is, um, he's 16 and he's a a budding intellectual, fascinating to be his father and and be with him on his own journey. But he, um, recently was, he went digging around to the school library and read a book. Um, he read Descartes and I got so excited when he said that and I started telling him all about Descartes and then I stopped myself and asked, would you please tell me what you know about Descartes? And so he did, he was able to, you know, explain the four maxims very nicely. And I said, Nathan, you know, the one beautiful thing about, uh, about Descartes and how much impact influence he's had is we've taken his scientific method, this process, and we've married it so deeply that we feel like we can um, 
slice and dice everything down and analyze it. And I said, what's beautiful is at the end of each one of these paths of knowledge, no matter how far we go, there's always more mystery. Well, and the other big one with Descartes, I mean, I, I should warn you, I was a philosophy major. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Is the uh, uh, complete separation of mind and body. Hmm. Right? I am because I think. Yeah. So, so the separation, the split between spirit and matter, mind and body, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not putting this all in Descartes' sh- shoulders, but certainly he was the one who made it explicit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're living with a pretty serious legacy of that idea being so pervasive in the culture. Um, it, you know, we see it in the way we treat the earth. We somehow yes. think we can do things to the earth and it won't impact our bodies. Does not happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Araya, one thing that's been so refreshing, and I remember a, uh, I think it was a Facebook note you wrote at one point. Uh, you said something about, you know, having experienced some some kind of energy work or something, and you said, you said how you approach all of these things with a great deal of skepticism, and yet you maintain this balance between being willing to be open to all of these wonderful experiences and also be skeptical of them and of the story. And I'm, I'm really interested in that because that seems like a very difficult balance to maintain. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm helped in this in a number of ways. I have two sons who are, are rigorously um, intellectually uh, honest, you know, um, and so they will press for, uh, you know, I think where we get into trouble is we can be really clear about what our experience is. But it's the explanation that gets slapped on that, that we want to kind of question a little bit more sometimes, you know. Um, and, I, and I feel us reach for things that we can't know, and I understand it completely, um, because we, we want some comfort, right? So if you take a very um, popular idea in the New Age community, everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. Now, this is where the philosopher in me does come out. Are, are we talking first cause reason? Everything being caused? Yes, in a material reality, it's cause and effect. It's, of course, a huge mishmash of, of elements that we often don't know everything about. But um, this suggestion that everything that happens to you uh, in your life or happens around you, you know, um, was orchestrated somehow. And, and bringing that together with uh, some reasonable explanation for your experience of having some free will choice is an interesting one. And I admit that I have a frustration with a lack of kind of um, rigor around these things so that people kind of throw them out there. And I go, so, you know, what does that mean? And people, when pressed, some people will say, for instance, that when I was a young woman, I was raped. I learned a great deal from that, and I've been able to use that in, in work I do with women who are raped. But I would never say that something larger than me or within me orchestrated the rape so I could do that work. We can learn from anything and everything if Mm -hmm. we choose to. Um, But then claiming in hindsight, well, that's why that happened. Somebody orchestrated, someone actually suggested to me that my soul and the soul of the man who raped me had an agreement. And he had agreed to rape me to teach teach me what I needed to learn. I just think that's, I think it's garbage. But I also think it's claiming something we can't possibly know. We just... We can't know it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I'm, I'm pretty um, rigorous about asking people when they make statements what it means to them. Mm-hmm. What, what do they think that means? And what are the consequences for that in terms of their own responsibility in their own lives for their own choices or other people's responsibilities? So, you know, I, I have incredible experiences, and I worked in a shamanic tradition. I still do on a daily practice basis where things I can't explain occur all the time. But the older I get, the less uh, comfortable I am with slapping a, an explanation on those. Yeah. Well, that's in this, <laughs> one of the, um, one of the designations. So the blessed are the weird thing, uh, you know, and misfits, mystics, writers, painters, troubadours. And I, I added the word heretics at one point, uh, Oriya. And you clearly are a heretic because you don't fit nicely in, in uh, some of these different communities, do you? No, no, but it is my um, ongoing prayer um, to express, uh, you know, to not hedge on, on the questions I have 
um, mm. without being, uh, you know, with being as kind, kind and clear at the same time is always my ongoing quest, you know, uh, not to, not falling into something derogatory, um, yeah. but, you know, sort of challenging us to, to think about what we're saying and what it means. You know, um, I remember ironing my shirts for church when I was a young man and listening to tapes I had gotten at the rate at the uh, library, Oriah. Um, and I remember listening to Carolyn Mace's sacred contracts on tape mm -hmm. and, um, ironing my, starching my church shirts. And I remember being blown away by the notions she was talking about. And what I came to with that was, well, I can't know for sure about mm -hmm. this concept but I do love the idea. How would it change my life if it were true? So I don't have to accept exactly. it as truth, but how would, yeah. and, and you know what? It's interesting. That has actually been a really neat effect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, I really, I mean, you know, human beings are meaning making creatures um, mm. and we work with symbols all the time and we work with story all of the time. That's what we're doing. So yeah. I, you know, I really encourage people to start looking at things like that. So, I, you know, in the shamanic tradition, I come from, we work a lot with dreams. But if something happens on the tonal, on the physical plane, uh -huh. uh, you know, something unusual, I will often think to myself, hmm, if this was a dream, what do I think it would mean? Mm. Um, and, you know, without having to make a decision about it's a sign someone has orchestrated, you know, but, but taking it as, as the possibility of meaning, of insight. If I think of myself as having a sacred contract with the people, the family I was born into, and given everything that happened there, what might that have been about? You know? So I have no problem with doing that. I have a problem with people saying to someone else, well, yes. you and the guy who raped you must have had a sacred contract, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you. That's great. You know, um, I'm just getting notes from a producer that our time is running very quickly here. And I want to make sure and get this, uh, Araya, because I, I sort of assume that everyone listening, maybe everyone in the world has heard or read your um, poem, The Invitation. And I would love it if you're willing. Would you mind sharing that with us right now? I'd be happy to. Absolutely. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for and if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, to remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself, if you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul, if you can be faithless and therefore trustworthy. I want to know if you can see beauty, even when it's not pretty, every day, and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand on the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the full moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after the night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in the empty moment. Thank you so much for um, reading that with us, Aria. Aria. That pleasure. is beautiful. And I, I know you've heard probably tens of thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times uh, how beautiful it is. 
What would you say have been some of the more unusual responses, reactions you've had from people when they've read or listened to you? Uh, it's funny. What springs to mind is the most usual, which is that people uh, ex- people say that, that I have expressed something that they felt and couldn't articulate. Mm. And that's so common, a comment, that it really tells me, and from all around the world, different cultures, you know, all over the place, and it tells me that our our central core longing is very common in human beings. You know, that what we want, the intimacy we want to live with, with ourselves and others, is, is obviously very core. Um, you know, the, the, the variety has been, there have been a few strange um, <laughs> emails where people have held me responsible for the ending of their marriage um, or, 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 or engagement or something. Um, I once got a letter from a man who said, "Well, my uh, my my the the woman I was about to marry uh, read your poem and then went and got the book and then she broke off the engagement and he was furious. Uh, um, you're ruining people's lives." And the odd thing was, the next week I got a letter from her mother, from the mother of the bride to be, saying, "Thank you, thank you, thank you." Now, of course, I can neither take credit nor blame for this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, either either way, you know, um, I tried as gently as possible to say to the man, you know, I hear you're in excruciating pain, and I'm sure as time passes, it will occur to you that it wasn't reading something that made her break the uh, engagement, you know. Um, so, but people clearly, you know, one way or another, uh, feel some kind of resonance with it. A lot of people do, and that surprised me. I mean, I had not anticipated. I have a sense, Araya, as I, especially as I hear you read this in your own voice, that you wrote this for yourself, truly. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. But I I mean, I'd have to say that all the writing I do is for myself first. Mm -hmm. You know, publishers are very fond of saying, who's your reader? Picture your reader. And I'm picturing myself. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm writing what I need to hear, what I need to express and what I need to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a there's a roomy quote on your site. In fact, because uh, I just got a note from the producer saying we're down under five minutes now, and I know that that will quickly quickly go away. Um, so let me just make a uh, a point here to make sure that everyone listening today and in the future can can find you at oriamountaindreamer.com, and that's Oriah with an H. oriamountaindreamer.com. Um, find out all about these books and various blogs and various ways you can you can experience Araya. But Araya, at the bottom of the front page, it says here by Rumi, there are lovers content with longing. I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. That was uh, significant enough for you to put it right on your front page. Tell us about that. Well, you know, the invitation, the, the poem in the book, is really about the longing. And so I have tremendous faith in our longing if we if we go deep enough with it. We have to be careful here because advertisers know what our longing is like, too. And so, you know, our longing for peace is is portrayed to us in a car going along a coastal highway with no other traffic. So, you know, we have to be careful that we don't think it's the car that's going to give us that. Um, But I do have tremendous, it's like an inner guidance system, you know, the thing that we really, uh, the soul of us aches for. Um, But we could get stuck there, you know, kind of stuck in the daydream of imagining what that would be like, as opposed to living very close to that and bringing that to each moment. Um, if what we long for is intimacy, then we can be intimately with the moment wherever we are, as it is right now. Now, some of those moments are easier than others. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, the dance was, okay, I'm clear about what I, what I ache for, what I long for, but I'm not so clear about how I live true to that. Mm-hmm. And that's really why that that translation from Coleman Barks, you know, that there are lovers content with longing. I'm not content with just longing. I want to live that. Yeah. That's beautiful. And, and, you know, Araya, we're down to under two minutes now and I, um, I just wish we had longer. So maybe someday, Oh, and by the way, I I mentioned as the show started, it's Friday the 13th. I feel particularly lucky because as you said, before the show started, you, I caught you at a weak moment and you said, yes. And I, (laughs) I want to make sure and say, thank you for that. Thank you for being weak just for a minute. So I could, so I could get you on our show. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a pleasure. Yeah. So appreciate that. And since we have just a minute left, why don't you tell me or tell all of us, if you have 
any any further thoughts for us, those fellow travelers of us who have had a chance now to share a few notes from the road? Just what should we do this weekend? How should we how should we be present with ourselves fully? Well, you know, I mean, the the old wisdoms are are there for a reason, which is to say that the easiest way to be present is to anchor yourself in the breath. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, without a, a lot of highfalutin ideas, um, you set your, you know, your watch or some other kind of thing for every couple of hours, and when it goes off, you take three deep breaths and follow your breath in and out of your body, and that'll bring you present. Yeah. All right, I hear the music, which will shut us down. But thank you so much. I wish you a wonderful weekend, and we hope to someday catch you weak again so you'll come back. <laughs> my pleasure, Jacob. Thank you so much. All right, my friends, you've heard Araya Mountain Dreamer. Thanks for being with us. We encourage you to do as you always do on the weekend. Go get your shine on. Take care.